the chat if you would like to. Um, and I think we can probably get started. So um, today, it's all about um, data security and GDPR. We have the brilliant experts in her field, Joe Brianti, with us today um, to share all things GDPR with you. So there will be an opportunity to talk, ask questions, etc., and pick her brains about that and her company is JLB Business Consulting so I'm sure she'll introduce that as well. So I'm um, I'm here if you need anything just pop it in the chat and I will hand over to Joe. Thank you very much. First things first I'm going to launch this little poll to ask you what your current level of confidence and um, knowledge experience of data protection in GDPR is and then we'll repeat that at the end and Hopefully you've learned something at the end of the session. So I'll give you all a couple of minutes to, to do that before we get started. Okay, so we've got 13 of the um, 15. Anybody else got an answer? Oh. One more to answer. Okay. Right, let's have a look at the results. So, three of you are very confident in your knowledge and um, 11 of you feel like you could do a little bit more. So that's cool. Um, hopefully at the end of this presentation, you'll have um, a clearer or be more confident about what you need to do, okay? So Rachel, are you gonna cover those first couple of slides? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Do you want to um, move your, your slides on, Joe? Oh, yeah, sorry. That's all right. Cool. So as you know, um, this is series two of Recover and Rise, mm -hmm. and it's all about customers and marketing. So we're we're getting towards the end of it. We've got a few more left, and then we'll be moving on to series three and four, which are about systems and productivity and growth and expansion. Mm -hmm. Not delivered by us, but delivered <laughs> by the other um, partners in in the series. Okay, Joe. So we are on uh, number five today, and then coming up, we've got me Measuring Marketing ROI with Stu, who's here today as well, and we've got Visitor Economy Specialist Masterclass, and we are lucky to have a special guest at that one. We're going to have the Artisan Bakehouse owner come along and talk to us about how they adopted digital during lockdown and share a real life story. So I think that's going to be a brilliant session. And then at the end, there's an opportunity to network with other business owners, with the digital champions ask any of the speakers questions on a panel event on the 2nd of November. Okay, so over to me. Um, in this session, I'll just outline some of the objectives. I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the data protection regulations that you need to consider for your business. I'm gonna clarify what exactly constitutes data from a regulation point of view. We're going to look at the key principles um, and the key roles and responsibilities that GDPR um, introduces. We're going to look at um, the rights. We're going to look at some data protection best practice. And then I'm going to talk to you about two important areas, which is data breach and subject access request. So first off, who am I? Um, I'm aware that many of you haven't met me before. I've got 30-ish, and the ish hides many years. 
of commercial experience in a range of roles in project, program and portfolio management. Very diverse background from Jaguar cars to TUI travel um, to TFL and the Medical Research Council. So quite broad. I've got IT and compliance and um, data background and I am now a qualified data protection officer. So quick facts, and this is just background so that you understand the landscape of where you fit in. 107 countries now have privacy legislation. 66 of those are considered to be developing nations. So privacy is not something just for us. 524 organizations in 17 countries experienced a data breach in 2020 while half the world was locked down due to COVID. So that gives you some sort of background that it is a global situation. Global fines under GDPR as at when I took this stat was 123 million, with the smallest being 28 euro and the largest being 50,000 euros. 721 complaints were upheld or partly upheld in the last 12 months to the ICO. And that was out of 1,300 and something. And that is complaints around how business owners are managing data. So first question, is this relevant to my business? Well, the short answer is yes. It doesn't matter how small you are. It doesn't matter whether you are early stage startup or more established. You hold personal data, so therefore this is relevant. Some of your businesses will also hold and manage special category data, which we will look at later, and they have even more issues and, and management processes. Data protection in the UK is managed by the Information Commissioner. I've put the website address there. You'll get a copy of the slides later, so don't worry about kind of writing that down. And as business owners, you should be registered with the Information Commissioner's Office. It costs you £40 in the first year. And um, if you agree to pay by direct debit, you get a £5 discount. And they just send you a little reminder a month before they're going to take <coughs> the direct debit. OK, I've put the link there. You'll get that in the slides later. So first things first, what are the key data protection regulations in the UK? Everybody refers to GDPR. Um, and GDPR is an EU um, regulation. And when we were part of the EU, we had one version of GDPR. Post-Brexit, we have two versions. We have the EU GDPR and we have the UK GDPR. Now, if your clients are only UK-based and you never work with anybody outside the UK, you don't need to worry about the EU regulation because you are not targeting EU clients and you're not working with them. Um, you can then look at just the UK GDPR. At the moment, as at the moment I'm stood here, there is no difference between the two, but there will be changes because I'm already looking at changes that are possibly coming down the line later on. Um, the Data Protection Act 2018 um, is the UK name that we gave to e EU GDPR on the 25th of May 2018 when we were all going crazy about GDPR. So that is the name of GDPR on the UK statute books. Eventually, UK GDPR will disappear, okay? Now, sitting alongside of that, you have the Privacy and Electronic Communication Regulations. Big chunks of that are not relevant to small businesses. However, the section in there on email marketing and cookies, which we'll talk about, is relevant. OK, but everything else is more to do with ISPs and those kinds of things. So first off. What is personal data? 
it's your name, your address, telephone number, email address, or a combination of those. So as an example, if you are a company where there are four people called John Smith, the name John Smith doesn't identify a particular individual because on its own, you can't identify which one of those four people it is. If there's only one person called John Smith in your business, it is identifiable. It's also the description. So that old man that lives at number 15, that clearly identifies an individual and therefore that can be classed as personal um, data. The email address, if the email address uses the name joe.brianti at, then that clearly identifies me. So that's personal data. Now that's really important for you to understand because there is a lot of discussion around email marketing about whether you can do B2B marketing or um, using somebody's personal email address. And we'll talk a bit more about that as we go through, but it's important that you remember that section. Special category data. Um, this data requires a lot of extra looking after. We've got religious beliefs, sexual orientation or questions about the sex life, um, health information, political opinions, criminal record, biometric and genetic data and trade union membership. Some or all of those may not be relevant in your business, but in other businesses, it will be very relevant. The next thing is what is processing? And this is in the context of the, the law, what is processing? It's filling in forms, it's writing client notes, it's recording a video. So the video that we've got here, we can all see each other's faces. There's personal data there because your face is unique to you. Taking photos, email to named individuals, automated decision-making. So you're thinking here of things like the Tesco club card where you swipe and they collect data about your shop and they make automated decisions to send you money off vouchers. Anything that operates like that comes into there. If you are adding, editing or deleting database records from your CRM system, your email marketing system. If you are transferring data between technical systems, if you are sharing data between business locations, if you have more than one office, all of these things are classed as processing from a GDPR and data protection point of view. We're gonna start now talking about some of the rules. And the first thing to understand is what are the key principles within the regulation for processing data? First off, you must, you must process it lawfully, fairly, and in a transparent manner. You must um, limit the uses of that data, and it must be limited to the explicit and legitimate purpose for which you have gathered it. So what that means is, if you collect data from a customer for providing service A, you cannot automatically market to them for service B without requesting permission because that is outside of the rules. You should minimize wherever possible the amount of data you collect. So look at the data collection forms you have. Do you actually need every single question on there, is it pertinent at that point? You are required to keep the data that you hold about customers, past and present, up to date and accurate. So you need to have a mechanism to check people's addresses are up to date, their email addresses are up to date, all of those things. You should not keep the data for longer than necessary. So 
you have to think about what is your data retention policy. Now, some of your data retention rules will be specified by another piece of legislation. Exactly, for example, um, you're thinking there about HMRC records. You have to keep your finance records for seven years. So that is the length of time. Some codes of conduct, some trade bodies might specify something different. So you are governed by those rules. Um, but you need to think and assess what they are particular, particularly, I should say, to your business. Um, you also have the principle of ensuring appropriate security of the personal data. So have you got a backup? Have you got antivirus? Have you got malware protection? Have you got user access restrictions? Um, and various other things around securing your data. And the new one that was introduced as part of GDPR is accountability. There is a requirement on you as business owners to demonstrate how you actively manage the data in your business. So in the past, people have collected data, they've sat it in their CRM system, they've not done a data cleanse, they've not updated it, and there's been no accountability for that. Now you are required to show that you monitor, manage, and actively manage the processing of data within your business. So now we know what data we're collecting, we know what the principles are, then you have to consider one of these legal basis for um, processing the data within your business. The first one, consent. Have you had permission from your um, customer to collect that data? Now, that is most often used as a marketing and uh, within marketing, I should say. So in theory, if there's a customer, they're going to give you data happily in order for you to deliver the service. But that has a different meaning in marketing and we'll look at that later. You collect the, lead, the data to deliver um, a contract you have a legal obligation. So this is where you're complying with the law. So it's things like, again, HMRC, HR regulations, those kinds of things. Vital interests is where you are collecting data where it is essential to protect somebody's life. So an employee, you might ask them about health conditions so that if they become ill at work, you know how to deal with that or you can share that with a paramedic if something happened. Public task is something that small businesses will not ever come across. This is only relevant for local authorities, NHS, those types of organisation. Um, legitimate interest. Now, this one is most commonly used in marketing and it's always the one that is abused the most. Um, the legitimate interest is not yours as a business owner, it is the legitimate interest of the data subject or the individual. And when we talk about the email marketing section later, you will see how that comes into it. There are three roles and responsibilities within GDPR and data protection regulation. There is a data controller, which every business owner becomes a data controller because you determine the purpose and the means of processing the data within your business. So you say how you collect it, you say when you collect it, where you collect it from, how long it's kept for, and all of those things. The data processor would be your staff, would be your subcontractors, your outsourced team, if that's relevant. 
and they process or do things to the data on behalf of you, the controller, based on what you tell them to do. So the controller decides, the processor does. And then there's the data protection officer. Public authorities, local authorities, NHS, etc., they must have a data protection officer. Small businesses, dependent upon the size, may not need a data protection officer. However, if you are doing large scale systematic online tracking of behavior, i.e. you run something like the Tesco club card scheme, um, or you are an organization that does large scale processing of special categories of data. So if you are an organization um, running a health clinic and you have a number of um, therapists or counsellors working for you, where they are all collecting health, wealth, well-being information, you should think about whether you need a virtual data protection officer or an on-call data protection officer to support you, because you will have additional requirements there. Um, I've put here that it's unclear on a definitive position for the SME community. And the reason for that is that they have made some statements about whether slightly bigger companies are going to have to have a DPO based on the number of employees. There's a question mark around that, but I wanted to put that out there because it will come up at some point. Um, the DPO must be a senior person, or if you're using a virtual person, they must have a direct report to the senior team, and they must have the authority in order to say to the senior team that what they're doing is not right, and that we must make this decision to comply with the law. So, Individual rights. This is relevant to every single person on this call, not just as a business owner looking after the rights of their customers, but to all of you as individuals, as customers of other organizations too. We all have the right to be informed. So here it's about transparency, it's about privacy notices, it's about understanding what is happening with the data that we provide or that your clients provide. We all have the right of access. So we have the right to ask any of the companies that we are customers of to have a look at all the data that they collect and process about us. And at any point you could have a request from one of your customers to see what data you have collected about them. We all have the right to rectification. So this and the right to erasure are often linked to the right of access. Because what will happen is, and what you can do, is you can ask for all of the data that a company holds about you. You look at it and you say, I want you to rectify these errors and or I want I'm withdrawing my consent and I want you to erase the data that you hold on me. Now, the caveat there is that you can erase some of the data, but you would never be able to erase the data relating to um, HMRC or where you have to comply with some other regulation that is classified as more important. You have the right to restrict processing so you can block or suppress processing. So here you're thinking about um, the telephone preference service. You can register your email, you can register your telephone number with these opt-out lists, as can your clients, 
and they can say to you, I do not want to be a part of this anymore. The right to data portability. Um, your client can request the date that you transfer all the data that you hold on them to somebody else who is going to deliver the same service. They have that right and you have to comply. Um, you have the right to object as to your clients. Um, here you're thinking about you can object to being part of a public interest research. The obvious one is, is the COVID scenario. There have been quite a few people who have objected and been allowed to restrict processing and linking it to that, their data relating to um, information around COVID. And you have rights and so do your clients in relation to automated decision making. And I've linked that here to things like loyalty cards, automation in your marketing or your processing systems. Oh, oh I don't know why that's happened. Oh, because it's bringing it slowly. Sorry, that's an error on my slide. I've no idea why it's suddenly bringing all those in like that. Um, so the data inventory, when you start to think about um, assessing your um, data protection status, the first task is to create a data inventory. This identifies what data you collect and process. It identifies what software you're using to collect the data you process. It enables you to conduct due diligence on the software being used to process the data. And it evaluates where your data is being hosted. And it records who has access to your data. OK, Ooh, apologies. So the data inventory, now that I've got all that on there, I can put it all into one picture. The data inventory allows you to assess what software you're using, what data you are storing and processing in each piece of software, who has access to it, and it enables you to look at all of the privacy policies and you record all the privacy policies and your assessment of those. And the reason that you do this is one, you need to know that information for transparency purposes so that you can put this into your privacy policy. And you also need to know this because when you get subject access requests, if you don't know where to start with collating all the data that you hold on an individual, you could spend an awful lot of time running around like a headless chicken to collate it all into one place. Um, when quickly looking at data inventory will tell you, okay? So now we're gonna to start to look at how we apply some of these things in your business. Now, the first thing we're gonna talk about is consent because consent is really very important, particularly in, from a marketing point of view. If you are signing people up to a mailing list, then you know it yourself, you signed up to mailing lists, you should be asked to consent to receive ongoing marketing materials. And in a moment, I'll show you a checkbox and we'll, we'll talk around that. But consent establishes a very high standard as a lawful basis for processing. And the control of access and consent must sit firmly with the individual. They must opt in to show consent. They cannot um, be presented with a pre-populated form or checklist and um, be asked to opt out. And assumed consent is not acceptable either under GDPR. Consent must be explicit. So your, in, your clients and your contacts must give an affirmative action 
to prove that they have consented. And blanket consent is not enough. If you are asking them to consent to marketing activities, you've got to be clear about what those marketing activities are. So as an example, and I'll show you a checklist, a, a sign up form in a moment. If you want to market to somebody via email marketing, text marketing and direct mail, they have to agree to receive each of those formats. OK, if the consent is only for email, you only need one checkbox and they should consent to that one item. And as I'm sure you all know, within email marketing, you must offer the right to withdraw consent using something like the unsubscribe button at the bottom of your email. So what does this look like from an email marketing perspective? So this is one that I've collected here. So you can see here that this, this is to access a um, free download. We're asking for the first name, the email. And we've, this particular organization have given a statement that says, I want to receive more resources and you can unsubscribe at any time. So we're complying with the options there and there is an unfilled checkbox that they can fill in. So it's an active consent there. Additionally, which I always recommend, and this feeds into the transparency requirement, there's a link there, obviously it doesn't show here, but that is a, a hyperlink direct to the privacy policy of the organization. OK. Now, the next step of linking into consent is cookies, because. Cookies need to be um, uh, cookies sit within PECA, Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations, and you need to <coughs> advise people visiting. <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Pe advise people visiting your website that you are using cookies. And I'm thinking here of things like um, Facebook Pixel, which you might use in the background of the website to help you target people for advertising. Um, Google Analytics for tracking people's um, movements on the website, where they come from and all those kinds of things. They all sit into the cookie banner. So for those of you who don't know what cookie is, it is a small text file that will identify your computer to a network, i.e. the Internet. Cookies can improve your browsing experience, and these will often be described as functional or essential. And those types of cookies help you to render an image or a video, or they do something that helps your website perform well, load quickly. Cookies can personalize your experience of the web. And this is where you start to get into some of those tracking cookies. But cookies can also be malicious. There are some types of cookies called zombie cookies. And if one of those land up on your laptop, it's very difficult to get rid of them. They, as fast as you delete them, they'll come back. And they can also put in nasties and, and create problems with um, Trojans and viruses and things like that. So this is an example of the cookie banner. And this is used, or there's two different types here. The top one is created <coughs> with a plugin on WordPress called CookieBot. And this is perfectly compliant with legislation because on here, I've got the option of allowing or disallowing cookies. So I'm able to give my consent, okay? So the green ticks here can be unchecked 
and I've got the option to look at what cookies are there. And I can use necessary cookies only, necessary being those functional and essential cookies that make the website work properly. This here at the bottom, this is an example of a different type of um, cookie banner. And this was actually on a Squarespace website. And um, yes, this is okay, um, but there's nowhere here, even when you click on read more, when I can say, I don't want to accept these cookies. So I'm unable to give full consent in this instance, okay? So next thing, I just wanted to show you a little bit about the compliance around your website. Um, and I wanted to show you this, it's not very clear here, but on the bottom of the website, I have listed the ICO registration number for my business. And I recommend, there's not a regulation that says that you must do that, but I highly recommend it as part of your transparency and communicating that you are sort of working towards your compliance. It is, however, important to have these, and this is the other thing I wanted to show you, it's a privacy policy um, and the cookie policy. Now my cookie policy is generated by CookieBot as part of that installation of the plugin. There will be lots and lots of different ways that you can do that. That's just the way I choose to do it. And I also make sure here that the written address where people can write to me, and I'm thinking here from a subject access request, which we'll look at later, there is a, a, an office address where people can write to me. I just want to put out there some best practice activities that I recommend you look at thinking about in your organization. Sharing data securely, using SharePoint, OneDrive, Google Drive, instead of emailing a file that has personal data in it, put it into a, a secure folder and share access to that folder, even if it's on a temporary basis. Now, the reason for that is that email can be intercepted anywhere between point A and B. So an email going from where I am in West London to where Rachel is in Worthing might go all the way around the world, bouncing from server to server along through the internet before it lands with her. And at any point that can be intercepted. So you are, it is more secure if you put your file in a folder, send an email to somebody saying the, that the file is in our shared folder and they can access it from there. Strong passwords, um, very interesting range of passwords I've seen over the years including the word password, which is the most common password used. And that takes about 3.2 seconds for a hacker to get into your system if that's the type of password that you use. So there's a, a variety of things that you can do to make a strong password. Make sure that you've got a mix of uppercase, lowercase, numbers, special characters, and also Think about applying those to pass phrases. So as an example, I often use three random words, one after the other. So I might put cat, webinar, mug. And within those words, I've changed some into ampersands. So it might be cat, webinar, ampersand, mug. And I've broken that up so that it's more complicated for somebody to try and break that. 
Additionally, I use a password manager because I know how difficult it is to try and remember the password because you've got your banking password, you've got your personal email, you've got your work email, you've got your account system, you've got your email marketing system, your Facebook, your Twitter, your LinkedIn. Uh, very quickly, you've got 20 or 30 passwords and it really is difficult to remember all of them. Don't use the same one for all of them. Get yourself a password manager. I choose to use LastPass. Other options could be Dashlane, One Password, KeyKeeper is another one I've heard of. And the last thing I would say on passwords is when you go onto Google and Google and Bing offer to store passwords for you, always say never. Do not ever just store your password in the cloud. Um, always put it in a password manager, never write your passwords down and don't leave them lying around where people can find them because that's the easiest way for somebody to just break into your systems and take personal data. <clears throat> How many of you using home broadband got the router out of the box when they sent it to you <clears throat> and you plugged it in, got it all working, and you're still using exactly the same password on that router today that it was when you took it out of the box, whenever that was. That's a default password. You should always change the password on your home broadband router. If you don't know how to do it, make sure that you speak to your ISP, uh, whether that's Virgin, whether that's um, Sky, Tesco, BT, whoever. If you don't know how to do that change, call them. They will help you to do that. The other thing to mention around home broadband is to consider setting up within your router guest access. So you'll have your access where you use all of your business data and then you have a guest access. So anybody visiting is still using your Wi-Fi but they're not using the same Wi-Fi channel that you are using for your business data. So you then have a little bit of security, additional layer of security. How many of you work in a cafe or you work at the gym or you work wherever, but you work away from your home base or your office? How many of you thought about whether the Wi-Fi you're using is secure? I would advise that you don't work on unsecured Wi-Fi in the cafe or anywhere else. You either look at getting a VPN, as a bare minimum, you should be asking the cafe owner if there's a password. If the Wi-Fi is not password protected, it's totally insecure. So you should be very, very careful about using that. Never open odd looking emails. Um, I had a couple last week, supposedly from Microsoft, requesting that I change my admin password on my system. All looked fairly kosher until you looked at the from email address and it was gobbledygook from gmail.com. And it was a spam email. They were phishing. The minute I clicked on that link, it would have taken me through to a, a website that looked very accurate. I would have entered my password and they'd have been in and taken my data. Those are phishing emails. Be very careful. If in doubt, delete them and then ring the person and say, I've had a random email. Was that correct? I've deleted it. This one, if you're a Windows user, you will know what I mean when I say that software updates can be the bane of your life. They start at the most inconvenient moment and they will take what feels like forever. You know, you think, oh, I'll just go make a cup of tea, come back. No, and they're still going. It is annoying, um, but do run those software updates. They are very important. They are there to block um, 
errors that have been found in the code that could prevent, present a risk to your system. So always run them. It is possible on Windows to specify times when the updates can auto run. I normally run mine now. I, I've changed the settings so that mine run overnight on a Friday. And on a Friday, I leave my laptop on overnight and then they run and it's all done. Always do the due diligence on your subcontractors um, and your outsourced team members. Do they have a privacy policy? Do they understand GDPR? What processes do they have in place? Don't forget that if these people are accessing the personal data in your business, you need to know that they are going to be as responsible with it as you are, because ultimately as the business owner, if something goes wrong, you will be the one who has to have the conversation with the ICO, not your subcontractor. So it's really important to look at the due diligence around what people are doing with your data. If a lot of that sounds really complex, scary, and just not the kind of thing that you want to get involved in, um, consider hiring an IT support company. It's a really worthwhile investment to protect your data. I do it, I pay, personally I pay, I think about 40 quid a month, and it's peace of mind for me. I, I don't have to worry about any of that stuff, it's all done for me. And they advise and guide me on how to do the different things, okay? Thinking about what we've talked about, we've talked about some preventative measures that we can take to protect the data in our business. The reality is that data breaches do happen. Even to the most careful of organizations, they do happen. So these are some of the types of data breaches that you could experience. And then we'll talk in a minute about what we do about it. So the one that we all know about and think about when we talk about a data breach is access by an unauthorized third party. And Realistically, that's not always that creepy guy that's hacking you from somewhere in deepest Mongolia or something like that. That could be unauthorized access by a subcontractor or an outsourced team member who's looking at data they shouldn't be looking at. OK. Um, sending personal data to an incorrect recipient. How many of us have pressed reply all instead of reply? and sent something that we shouldn't have done to 20 people instead of just two people. It happens, we're human, we make mistakes. It's just how you manage that. Computing devices containing personal data getting lost or stolen. Something I should have put on the previous slide, but I'll, I'll talk about it now, is my IT provider um, has encrypted my laptop and I also have a piece of software on there I haven't got a clue what it's called so I just refer to it as wipe if I ever lost my laptop if ever my um, laptop was stolen I could just ring my IT provider tell him he presses a button and my entire laptop is wiped completely remotely by him at any time of the day or night so first of all it's encrypted and if they are if they are able to get past that the data's gone and it mashes the the hard drive so the the laptop becomes worthless to them um alteration of personal data without permission so here you're thinking about um, if you've got a subcontractor or an outsourced team member who makes changes to data without the permission of either you or your customer, that can be a data breach. It is a data breach. Loss of availability of personal data. So if you have a situation where your um, ISP collapses, um, a prime example would be Facebook. When Facebook, Twitter, not Facebook, Twitter, 
Instagram, all of those blacked out and there was a mass outage, that is actually a data breach. And if your email systems are compromised via phishing scams, that's also a data breach. So the worst thing has happened, you've discovered you've got a data breach. What do you do then? Well, the first thing is don't panic. The first thing you have to think about is, do I need to report it to the ICO? And the simple answer is maybe not. What you need to think about is how severe is the data breach? So, you know, is it just that I've pressed reply all instead of reply? What's the impact of that? Not a great deal. Perhaps a little bit of embarrassment on your part, but nothing significant. How many people are affected? Maybe one or two, or is it thousands? What type of data is it? Is it just name and addresses, or is it somebody's entire health details file? And what's the impact of the breach on individuals? So here, what you're thinking about is, if you've had a breach of your finance records, and all of a sudden, all the credit card details and banking details of all your customers are out there in the wild, that's a significant breach because the impact on potentially on your clients and customers is huge. There's a risk to their financial stability if people are able to access that. That's a reporting, a reply all on an email. No, it isn't, okay? If you do find that you have to notify um, the ICO, you have 72 hours from identifying and discovering the breach to undertake your initial analysis about severity and how many people are affected in which to notify them, okay? And as I say, you do not have to notify them at every single breach that you have, but you must log them. So you put them on a log, every single one. And I know that sounds random, but just fill it in on your log. And it shows that you are accountable and you are managing things. If your analysis of the data breach is that it is very high risk and it is very high impact, then you must also notify the individuals whose data has been breached. Right. So you if your credit if credit card details have gone, you must notify individuals. If somebody's health information has been breached, you must notify them. If you've done a reply all and you have breached somebody's name and address, you don't need to notify the ICO and you don't need to notify the individual. OK. So subject access requests. We mentioned earlier that these can be combined with the right to rectification and or erasure. They can be made in any format. Some people might email, um, raise a request via your contact form on your website. They might telephone you. They might have a conversation with you in the course of a meeting and ask, or they might email you direct. If you're unsure what they're asking for, clarify and make sure that what they're asking is actually a subject access request. The next thing to do is to validate the requester before proceeding. Depending on the type of business um, or organisation you are, you may have requests for somebody's data by a third party. As an example, somebody who has power of attorney, you might have a request from a parent about their child's data. Before you take time to gather all of this data together, Validate that the requester has the right to have that data. If you don't and you give them the data, you're risking creating a data breach. So it's important. And don't be afraid to go back to them and say, I'm sorry, I can't give you the data until you evidence that you have the right to this. 
So it's a power of attorney document, possibly. Um, it's evidence that they're a parent. You know your customers and, and your business is better. So think about how you would validate that. Subject access requests are time bound. You have 30 days from the initial request um, or initial validation to gather together all the data that you have to give them, redact the data so that you are only sharing data that's relevant to the individual and get it back to them in the format that they requested. You have to record the SAR in your log um, and then you respond to them after you've collect, collated, reviewed and redacted the records, okay? Penalties. There's been a lot of talk, certainly back in 2018, about the size of fines that are issued under GDPR. However, don't automatically think that, you know, you are going to be a business that's going to be facing 20 million euro fines. There's a tiered approach. The maximum fine could be 20 million euros. But if, you're, if your revenue in your business is 20,000 a year, 30,000, 40,000, whatever a year, you are not going to have that kind of fine. Um, the assessment of the level of fine will be based upon whether you've adhered to codes of conduct, number of people affected, risk to data subjects. Have you been negligent? Is this an accident? What action have you taken to mitigate and minimize risks in your business? Have you notified and contacted and spoken and dealt with the ICO within the time frame um, and being a willing participant in sorting out whatever the problem is? All of these factors determine the size of your penalty. But it is better to try and be as prepared and um, mitigate and show your accountability before you get to the point of penalty. And that's it. So I'll open the floor to questions, thoughts. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. I'm very comprehensive. So we've got um, quite a few questions that came in during the session. I'll just okay. go through those if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so the first one was, let me just go back. Um, so yeah, if, could you expand a little bit more on services contacting? Where is the line with that? Services? Contacting um, on a B2B basis. So, are we talking here about the email marketing? Yeah, so I, it was my question, Joe. Oh, right. yeah. <laughs> so, it, you know, so I, so I run digital marketing agency. Yeah. And so if someone contacts me, maybe an SEO uh, services inquiry, I, yeah. you know, and I've got the consent, right? We, are, we, may, we may contact you about, uh, you know, similar services and products. Yeah. I can think, um, am I then able to contact them, say, about... Okay. Um, so some of the kind of digital training. It's not quite the same service, but it is under my umbrella so of digital under, marketing. Under limited, uh, sorry, get my teeth back in. <laughs> if I contact you, Stu, and I say, I'm interested in your SEO services, right? And we have this conversation about the possibility of working together. You give me a quote, or we're having discussions about that. Using legitimate interest, you can contact me rely, uh, regarding um, SEO training or another strand of your business. The legitimate interest there is that I'm already interested in buying your services because we're talking about possibility of a contract and a quote, right? So there is a legitimate interest and you could include me into your email marketing list but you have to be transparent about that in all of your conversations your privacy policy and those kinds of things it's just about maybe tweaking the wording so that people are aware 
and it's the transparency. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Can I just ask a follow on from that before we go on to a different question, Josie? Of course. Similarly, yeah. um, if you if you weren't already interacting with students, so keep, keep using examples, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, uh, when can you say there's a legitimate interest to contact someone? So the it's the the so never unless someone's Le giving you their details. Legitimate interest, and and yes, I'm aware that out there there are people using legitimate interest in a very different way and some people are stretching legitimate interest to it being about the business's legitimate interest but it really isn't about your interest as a business legitimate interest is if i've bought a service from you and i've paid recently in the last let's say three months or so you can go onto my newsletter list okay if I've, you've provided a quote for me. If we've been having discussions about working together, there's a legitimate interest because I've been expressed an interest in your organisation, in the services that you provide. If I have requested, if I've made an inquiry and we've had discussions, there is a legitimate interest because I'm interested in you. If I have visited your website and you have tracked my visit to your website, um, but I've made no direct contact with you. Um, I have not expressed anything more than a fleeting visit to your website. There is no legitimate interest. So, if you meet people, let's say on social media, in a networking organization, you might think, well, there might be legitimate interest because I met them at a meeting, we had a chat. No, that's not legitimate interest either. What I advise people to do is to start the conversation to generate the interest and then invite those people to consent to be on your newsletter list, okay? Because legitimate interest is when there is either a formal relationship between the business and the individual or in the context of preparing for a formal relationship okay does that help thank you yes yeah. i think it's a, it's a minefield for small businesses isn't it in terms of how do you ever generate the clients if you can't ever go and tell someone who doesn't already work with you yeah about your yeah. services <laughs> you can you can but you, you know, we've got all of these uh, options, you know, we, it, there are ways and, and I, I'm quite a stickler about it myself and I won't, you know, people have, have sort of said to me, well, you should be putting these people on your list. No, you shouldn't because, you know, it's about building relationships because people buy from people, you know, and I know I've had conversations with coaches in the past who I work a lot with and they said, I've got to have thousands on my list. No, you don't. You know, better to have a, a list of 400 people who are regularly engaging, regularly interested in your material rather than lists where you're gambling on a percentage opening them and, and you know, that sort of thing. I know yeah, it's quite so it's a I'm talking to a, a marketing group, but you know. yeah. So, Joe, in terms of prospecting, yes, um, you do get companies out there like lead, you know, generating companies where yeah. they say that if the email is out in the public domain, then it's basically up for grabs, and you can email that that company. Yeah. Where you know, I presume that that's not correct. And so are, is there any kind of prospecting that we can do? So what I say to people is, let's just say that, and I've, I've had this conversation recently with a client or a prospective client who came to me and said, I've got this fab way of building an email marketing list. So I said, okay, let's talk about it. He said, I'm going to scrape 10,000 names and addresses off LinkedIn. He said, and I'm going to put them in my active campaign and then I'm going to send them. Da -da 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 -da. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, he said, because it's going to be great marketing. I'm going to get hundreds of sales. I said, OK, so no, you're not really. I said, I, I'm not. I'll put it out there. I'm not a marketing expert. I'm not a marketing specialist. 
what I'm saying now is a combination of kind of GDPR, business, and what I've learned along the way. Legally, if you're doing a data scrape or if you're buying a list, you have no legitimate interest because you have no prior relationship with that person. You have no consent because people have not actively ticked a box or said, yes, I want to receive an email from you. So you can't data scrape and then suddenly start marketing to them. Now, if you are going to buy a list, first things first, buy from a reputable organization. And then within the first 30 days of having that list, you send them one email, one email. And in that email, you say to them, your name and address was provided to me on a list. And because you may be interested in my product or service. So then you say to them, I'd like to send you marketing material. I send a monthly newsletter. I send occasional offers, et cetera, et cetera. Would you like to continue receiving these emails? And then you put a button in there that says yes. And if they positively press that, they have consented, you can continue to email them. Mm -hmm. If they do not press that button, or if they unsubscribe using the, the relevant sort of button below, you cannot market to them. Now, this is the risk with buying lists because you can buy a list of 10,000 people. You don't know whether they have been matched to your business and service. You don't know where they've come from. So you don't know whether it's a compliant list. I recently spoke to somebody else who asked a similar question about lists. And I said, well, where's that list coming from? Mm -hmm. And they said to me, well, just from them. And they've told me it's GDPR compliant. I yeah. said, how do you know? How are they evidencing to you that they've got consent? So I think um, Stu might have a follow up question. Yeah. For that. Well, OK. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I've got my hand up. Yeah. Uh, I don't think most small businesses will buy lists. So yeah. here's an example. Okay, imagine yeah. um, I've developed a bit of software that's um, been useful for a university to calculate their carbon footprint, for example. Yeah. Okay, right. I don't know where that example came from, but there it is. <laughs> and it's been successfully deployed by Portsmouth University. It's really great. It's really helped them, you know, reduce their carbon footprint. And yeah. I think, right, okay, I, I could really do with selling this to some of the universities. Okay. Yeah. Um, I then have a look at the University of Chichester's website. I then find the sustainability manager's contact details, which are publicly available yeah. on the website. I would like to send them an email to say, hello, University of Chichester sustainability manager. We've just developed this for Portsmouth. Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Would you be interested in having a chat about it? Where does that fall? Because that's what I think about prospecting. I think that's what a lot of small businesses will do to try. And, this is sales, not marketing. And I'm not talking about putting her in my email list. I'm not yeah. talking about so her unsolicited. That, this is me as a business of... trying to sell to another business. That type of one-off email where you have gone to a website and you have been able to say, you know, you can justify and validate why there might be a legitimate interest for that individual to be aware of your product and service. Now, you do that from your Outlook or your G Suite. You don't do it from... Absolutely, yeah. It's a personalised email. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, it's yep. a personalised, it's a one-off email, and you can do that, but you've got to do it in a very sort of relationship-building position rather than going straight in for sales and marketing. Absolutely. Yeah. That's 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 really yeah. answered a lot of my questions. Does that, Thank does you so that much. Help? That, that really does, yeah, because that, that felt mm -hmm. like a grey line, but that's you've really cleared that up, and that was, yeah, yeah. I think uh, quite an important point, point. There's a difference there is, between email marketing and kind of that thing yeah. versus sales. And, 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 yes, and, and sales and relationship building. And Perfect. if you're ever in any doubt about this, think about how you would feel about receiving what we very often class as spam from people who've got no relationship with this, no, and out of the blue, they're just suddenly, but personalize the email and say, in going on the example you've given, I've, you know, I've been working with, this university, this department, um, it could be of interest to you. 
let's chat yeah. and, and take it at that level rather than blanket marketing. Um, Lisa's right. got her hand up. Lupna's got her hand up. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of questions if you can just hold it. Are they okay. related to that? Are they related to Joe's question, guys? Lupna is yours. Uh, yes, it is. Okay, you go. Sorry to keep pushing the same point, but um, I was told I can get a list of businesses from the BIPC. <laughs> I don't know um, who BIPC are. Um, they are they're the Brighton Hove IP Centre, part of the British Library. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they have lots of databases, some in the UK, some global. Yeah. And so I'm just really unsure whether so, I can email, you know, a list of people. So uh, on, a B to, on a B2B basis, that's very much what we've just said about Stu. So if you took that list and you did individual emails to them, it's time consuming. But as part of that email, you can invite them to be in your email marketing software and, and regular marketing. But you should not be emailing a bulk email to a list. Yeah. Right. Campaign. So if you got this list. You first of all, you have to say where you got the list from, why you know it, it's considered appropriate for you to send it to them, and you know, then to start building that relationship and, and say, let's talk about my product or service rather than going in and, and trying to, you know, go in with that and, and not look at the consent and not look at the legitimate interest. There's got to be an interest in the person receiving that, even that B2B email. Does yeah. that clear it up for you, Luca? Yeah, so so if I did do it in a bulk email and it was literally telling them about my product, you're saying that I could be uh, reported for that? Well, it's, they again, could, it's, they it's, kind of, it's kind of a what if because... Are these, per, are these, is it personal data? Is it joe.brianti at, is it info at, admin at, right? If the email addresses on your list are info at company name, that's not personal data. And you can use those. But from, I guess, from a marketing perspective, those kinds of, in, those kinds of email boxes are, maybe managed by a receptionist a pa and they might not get in front of the decision maker that's a marketing sort of question and i think also you'd have to be cc so you're not sharing data between the recipients as well yeah all right thank you very much okay right. um so we had a question earlier from uh, vicky who was asking is why is it with certain we won't name entities that they require information that they do not need to know. I don't know if you can ask that one. Probably being too. <laughs> um, if people are asking for um, data that you don't feel comfortable giving and that you feel is of no relevance to the situation, as an individual, then you don't have to give that. As a business owner, as we said in the, in, in the presentation, one of the things that you need to think about is how you minimize the amount of data you collect. So one of the things I do with people that I work with is I get their data collection input points and their questionnaires and all of those things. And we go through them step by step. What does that do for you? Why do you need that? Do we need to have that question in there? And you minimize the amount of data. Now, as an individual, if you are on the receiving end of a questionnaire or a form and you don't feel it's appropriate, don't put it in there. And if you get part way through a form and it won't let you proceed unless you fill it in, then I would go back to the organization and I would say to them, why, why do you need this piece of data about me? Why, why is that relevant? And, and challenge them, feel free to challenge them. It's your right as an individual, because some of what we've talked about here is relevant to you as individuals, not just as business owners. Yeah, I think sometimes <laughs> it's to help them with their targeting, you know, later yeah. on. But if you, as, as Joe said, if you don't feel comfortable with it, then then challenge it. Yeah. Um, so we had another question earlier from Luna. If you use third party websites to manage all your data and it is all held on their server, is it the responsibility line with you or the platform that you're using? 
So, ooh, this is a very big one. So I'll try and make it as simple <laughs> as possible. As a business owner, you have an obligation to do due diligence on the systems that you use to process personal data in your organization, right? So let's just put that statement out there. The second statement is, as a small business owner, the reality of the world is that you have very little control over certain things, e.g. Google, the majority of the data that you store in Google will be stored in the United States unless you're paying for an account and you've specifically requested for it to be stored in the UK or the EU. So therefore, you are in a way, as a small business owner, at the mercy of the big tech companies that you are using to store and process and manage your data, okay? The best that you can do, and there are the words adequate and appropriate are used a lot in GDPR legislation, okay? So all you can do is undertake adequate due diligence and what I mean by that is Google are a big firm have I checked their security pro you know documentation on Google's website they will tell you what they do about security somebody like me reads those things and I can tell you that Google are very safe and very secure in their data practices they have achieved certain standards they are safe to store your data with right if you went to Billy Bob's IT firm, you don't know where Billy Bob are based. You don't know what Billy Bob's doing with the data. He's got no data security policy. He's a bit vague about what he does. Then due diligence should tell you to avoid Billy Bob. And if you go and work with Billy Bob, then you're putting yourself at risk. So as a small business owner, it is about adequate, appropriate provision that you can reasonably manage and control. Does that help? Does that answer the question? I think so, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Right, so um, how do you, we did talk about cookies a bit earlier and I did yeah. share a link to a guide to different types of cookies, but what it doesn't say in there is actually how do you know when you've got a zombie cookie? Do you know that? No. However, if you are um, using a good firewall, if you are using good antivirus, if you are using good malware, if you are regularly updating um, and all of those things, and you are, again, you are doing appropriate um, and as much as you can do, understand, afford, then you minimize the risk of getting them. But you can scan your website. The CookieBot, which is the plugin that I use, and I'm not an affiliate or anything, so I'm not promoting it because there's anything in it for me. It's just the one I use. That will do a scan of your website when you sign up for an account with them. And it will tell you every single cookie that you've got on your website. And it will tell you what those cookies do. OK, now you will be surprised. You may have a website where you've not put any pixels, you've not put any stuff on there, but plugins automatically create cookies. And it, that that will tell you what you've got and then you need that information for your cookie policy mm -hmm. does that help yeah. thank you so um if a user decides not to accept a cookie can you deny access to the website is there any legal issue with doing that no not at all if you you you, you can and i know of a number of websites that um refuse access to the content on the website once you refuse the cookies because ultimately 
if you're using the cookies to track somebody's behavior for then retargeting purposes or, you know, ads and all of that stuff, I don't understand that. But, you know, it, you use the cookies to target and track so that mm-hmm. you can create yeah. your Facebook ads, your Google ads and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, there's no reason why you can't re- reject. But would you really I mean, it may be, and again, I'm playing devil's advocate here, right? Because I'm not a marketer. So the law, the law says you must tell people and you must give people the, the option to opt out. I personally feel that if somebody's come to my website and they want to opt out of cookies, they're still interested possibly in my services and um things that I offer so if I say to them don't stay on my website am I possibly losing somebody who's just yeah I think in that early stage of interest I think this is related um so the person has um an alcohol website they sell alcohol and they have to have an age gate system on it so you have to say that in the UK to go on the website you're 18 or over and he's asking whether you know you could have a combined one button to accept the terms of use of the website the user agreement as well as the cookies and the data policy could you do it all in one um and it might not be something you can answer today but that i i I, I, i'm going to make a note of that and i will go away because i've not i've never linked i would never have thought to link those two together Mm, okay um because i think there's two different pieces of legislation there the yeah. age gate is very different to the cookies yeah um yeah okay. i'm, I'm gonna fine. make a note of that if that's okay and then yeah, i yeah, come I back to you right rachel sure. that's fine i can let him know um so if you send a link to a secure folder but you send that link via email yep. how would you recommend that they don't get intercepted so if it's a secure link, when you send the link, and I can talk about OneDrive, I'm not as familiar with other things, but mm-hmm. on OneDrive, I create a link to the folder and I set the security settings that only um, it's only valid for a certain time or it's, you know, or there's some other security step that has to be taken before it can be accessed. Um, by that person again it's not a hundred percent secure yeah and 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 I can't ever tell you that something is a hundred percent secure right it it's just it minimizes risk yeah and it could be that if you're working with a client as part of your business process right at the beginning of the relationship you set up an empty folder share that link to the empty folder and future emails say i've uploaded the file to our folder because that's a very anonymous sentence there's no link so nobody can see it 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 could be that that's the way you do it that's the way i do it yeah okay um so there are a couple of questions but just because we're losing people i'm just going to run the poll again if that's okay guys so okay you can just tell us you know your your confidence level now now that joe's been through everything that would be great thank you Okay, I think you've definitely um, improved people's confidence. So, uh, yeah, well done on that. That's great. So I'll just field um, the last couple of questions to you. Uh, are we? Uh, yeah, so some people aren't sure whether password manager, which I think they're referring to the Google one, is actually secure enough. Would you would you say it is? Which, which password manager, sorry? I think they must mean the Google password manager. I don't know anything about password manager, but if you are if you are in, let's say, Google Chrome and Google Chrome offers to store the password, don't use that because that is 
that is not the securest way of doing it. Okay, uh, yeah, that does go into Google Password Manager. So. Yeah, it's not, it's not the security. You've got no, you've got no security. If you use a, a specific password manager, as I say, I use LastPass. Mm -hmm. I have to log in to that password vault and I have to do a password. I use dual authentication and then I can access it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, right. Um, I'm very skeptical of where the data on the cloud is secure or not. Is there any check that we can do on certain cloud companies? So when you're doing that, again, it's looking at their security statement. It's looking at their privacy policy. Um, it is looking at um, their background. Are they well known? Um, Companies are obliged to put out on their website and tell you where their data is stored, how they're protecting it. So it's about looking at that documentation. They're in the due diligence. It's the due diligence around, you know, are you using a renowned firm like Google or are you using Billy Bob in the back street? Yeah. OK, great. Thank you. Um, now, I think hopefully, um, Ludna, your question has been answered now about um, emailing uh, customers and hopefully Samantha as well, because I know you said you've got some, some business cards, whether you can email those people. If it hasn't, then just, just raise your hand. That's fine. Um, other than that, I think really it's time to, to wrap up. The last, very last question would just be, would you recommend um, a particular firewall? What's the best firewall to use? Is there a plugin on WordPress for it? Um, I don't recommend any specific firewall. If you are using home broadband, a firewall is automatically built into your router, but yeah. do change your, your initial password. Yeah. Um, because I pay an IT provider to support me, um, I leave all of that kind of stuff to him. So. It, it's kind of I know it, it needs to be done but I pay an expert for that it's not my yeah. area of expertise there. okay no worries right so if you wouldn't mind just moving the slides on and I'll just quickly remind people about the support that is available following these webinars which is the digital champion support from Coast to Capital you can access eight hours of free support and you just need to contact Coast to Capital to be able to get that they will assign the right person for you We've got a couple of them here today. I'm one and Lisa's still around. Um, she's one as well. So depending on what you need support with, then you will get assigned to somebody and you can have that whole day free of charge. So it's a brilliant um, service to take advantage of if you would like to help implementing anything that you've learned on this webinar or another, another webinar as well. We've got a couple of webinars coming up um, left in this series that I did mention at the beginning. But as it's half past one, I will let you all leave and get on with your day and just thank you so much to joe for a brilliant session um on something which is a really complex area and can be pretty dry sometimes as well thank you for coming along and thank you to everyone today for coming as well thanks joe really informative and thanks, slightly joe. terrifying that was, that was, yeah some <laughs> important yeah, questions answered there <laughs> good good i'm glad thank you thank you take yeah. care Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye, Joe.